This week's guest is comedian and actor, Mr. Paul Putner. How are you, Paul? Hello, I'm very well. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome to my home. I know. You're very impressed. Is that, is that comics or records behind you? Uh, prison files. Yeah, no. It's, it's records, books, Cheb is what I call it. Um, just just nonsense, rubbish, stuff which I should have grown out years ago. And um, yeah, I'm just showing off, really, all my shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's the... Uh, it- it's the geeky equivalent of the people who have like rows of books behind them on Zoom calls when you see them on the news or whatever. They, you're like, you've never read those books. It does make you laugh, doesn't it? In fact, a friend of mine, he, um, who, uh, the, the, the celebrity, to, to give him, will remain nameless, but he used to, his job was to provide leather bound books. And he got a load of uh, Dutch phone directories from the 1960s and just would leather bind them and then just put them on bookshelves to make certain uh, boy band pop stars uh, libraries look very learned. <laughs> <laughs> it's but actually I, I, just I, full of people's phone numbers. Dutch people's phone numbers from the 1960s, yeah. So you can go along, ah, yes. It's, you do wonder about things like that, where you see, like, in stately homes and stuff, and you're like, a lot of this has got to be filler, because you didn't like having bare shelves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, have you always wanted to get on one of those ladders that slide along? Yeah. When you I, see it in Indiana Jones or whatever. Yeah. There's something about that, isn't there? I think it's... I don't know if it's the Natural History Museum, but one of the museums in Dublin has got like the sort of, um, you know, railings, little walkways each on each side. And and it just looks so much like fun. But then there was a sign that was like, you can't enter those sections because they're dangerous. And I was like, well, that makes me want to go on it even more now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but having uh, Dutch phone directories and books that you never read, I mean, it is a little bit like that, even with your own collection. I look at it sometimes and I think I'm 56. So, you know, I'm on, I'm, I've gone over the other side on the fulcrum of life. Am I ever going to listen to these records? All of them or read books or all those DVDs and CDs. And it's just, well, I just, you, I think everyone imagines that in their dotage, they're going to go, right. Yeah. Book number one, <laughs> and read them all. But we're not, are we? We just people. Some people just like stuff. Yeah, I used to pride myself on like my DVD collection. Like, oh, I've got such a big DVD and yeah. photos of it, and and now I, 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 like most of it is just in IKEA bag. I'm sort of in the loft conversion up here, yeah. where my office is, and lots of it is lots of the DVDs are now just shoved in big IKEA bags up the corner. Yeah. You know? It's and so ha- sad. Ha- half of them still got the, the cellophane on. Shrink wrap, yeah, yeah. Those ones that you get from, uh, yeah, Poundland. <laughs> you think, oh, I really want to see that Chevy Chase movie, Fletch Lives or something, and you, and it's still sealed. Uh, it's, it, it, is, it is a shame. Like, do you remember when there used to be a, a lot of YouTube videos where it would be um, film geeks who would, so today I'm going to talk about um, this movie. And then I'd have behind them all their DVDs. And then you just think, well, now everyone has your record, your record collection, your DVD collection. It's all there, isn't it? Yeah. There's no, you can't be elitist anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you, well, you haven't got the special edition with the, the bonus yeah. and all that. And now it's just, well, it's all online, isn't it? You can get whatever you want. Online. Yeah. I just think it's a shame, though. The un- Do you still get extras and, and bloopers and, and deleted scenes with stream stuff? I don't know, really. I don't, well, you don't, like, not on, not on Netflix and stuff. And that for me, that was always the selling point. Like, I'd be massively disappointed with a DVD oh. if it was just the film. Or, like, sometimes oh, they'll stick the trailer on. Yeah. Know. Especially the really old ones, because they didn't have anything and Boris Karloff isn't alive to do the commentary. 
on the 60th anniversary of Frankenstein or whatever. And it's like <laughs> the, the bonus features are interactive menus. <laughs> yeah, wow. or, um, or video diary. Yeah. And some of those are just crap on you. Just, just like five minutes of someone with their smartphone going up to a tired actor sitting on the set and going, oh, you're having fun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it. The Kirby Enthusiasm video diaries, just rubbish, really surprisingly bad. It's a, such yeah. a shame. It's nice when um, I bought the, it feels like, an, uh, but we can uh, loop it round to you and get, get on to you. I bought the King Rocker DVD last week and it was nice to see how much effort Stuart and Michael and oh, yeah. like fire had put into that, where it's like a proper little booklet and photos yeah. and, and Michael's put all the deleted stuff on there. And it was like, this, yeah. this feels old school. Like it feels like a proper DVD. I think people still love all of that. Don't you? You know, we just love packaging and, and something you can smell. Yeah. I, I, love, I love all of that. Yeah. It's it's like feels crap when you pay for something and then you've got nothing for you know it's just ones and zeros. There's no thing to look at and you do wonder. We went up to um, my other half treated me a few years back uh, for a trip to Liverpool to do the whole Beatles thing. Yeah, and we stayed at the Beatles hotel. We went to the Beatles museum and we went to the Beatles sauna or whatever you know we did everything <laughs> and um when we went to the beatles museum they had like here's the the letter that um that brian epstein wrote to to emi or here's here's the, the the piano that was used for this and and here's uh uh the guitar strings george had in hand but all of that sort of stuff yeah and the lyrics that was the main thing here's a handwritten lyrics for and you think, well, what would it be at the Ed Sheeran Museum? You know, here's Ed's USB stick he yeah. used. It's a shame, isn't it? That the digital, like you say, it's all up there. And all the papery stuff is going to diminish, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah. It's just, uh, just future landfill. Yeah. And on that note, <laughs> yeah. just cheering, isn't it? Yeah. I've, uh, I've I've mentioned it now. I was going to save it to, for towards the end of our chat, but I've mentioned it now, so we might as well uh, talk about it. You uh, you turn up in in King Rocker, um, Stuart Lee and Michael Cummings' documentary about the Nightingales. You uh, you pop yeah. up. Was that a fun scene to do? Because I'll, I'll just set it up for anyone that hasn't seen it. It's like mm. Stuart Lee telling the story of his favourite band, well, musician and band. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. he's uh, ha sort of halfway through the story. They talk about a sitcom that he he wrote, but never got made. And so Stuart got the script, and then got a load of uh, modern comedians to all reenact the the script. And and you're one of the comedians yeah. in that group. That's right. And who else? It was uh, Bridget Christie. Yeah. Uh, um, Nish Kumar. Kevin yeah, Kevin Nish, Alvin. Um, Sean Walsh. And it was lovely to get us all together to read um, the script because I think it was co-written with Stephen Wells, yeah. who's a melody maker, scribe, quite an angry chap, um, very funny, clever writer. And then so you could see what the humour in it. And we're, yeah, it was, it was good fun to do that. Yeah. But we, we actually read the whole thing, but I think that, you know, it just get edited down just to the, just to the couple of minutes in the film as is what always happens. Yeah, but it was it was just lovely to see, you know, because <laughs> uh, especially because, like, obviously it, it's, you know, it's Stuart making a documentary, not necessarily Stuart as a comedian. And then no. so to see this room full of, like, you know, lots of the top sort of comedians and comedy actors, it was, it was so much fun, you know, reenacting this script. Oh, yeah, well, anything, if Stuart wants something, you just think, yeah, great, yeah. Because he is so passionate about stuff. And it was a shame because we were all looking forward to going to see the Nightingales. And of course, um, that bloody thing happened, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. But I gather they're out on tour now. Uh, yeah, next next month was a, night, a plug for the Nightingales, yeah. Ted Kensington. Say again, sorry. 
Ed, Ed Chippington, who was an first one Nightingale, he's he's actually supporting them. Yeah, that, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to that tour. That should be uh, great fun. I may, managed to catch them on their their last tour last year, and they oh, they right. are so good. They are so good. Yeah. So, and you know, it's one of those things that I'll hold my hands up. I I didn't know very much about them before King Rocker came out. Right. And that documentary just made me fall in love with them, you know. Well, it was a love letter, really, from Stuart to them, definitely. Yeah, he said, uh, when, when I interviewed him about it last year, he said uh, he's made him like a 50-year-old fanboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's not to do things like that, especially when these unsung heroes who don't get the exposure... It's good that everyone's story is told from Queen and Elton John to the likes of the Nightingales and XTC or one of those sort of bands. You know, it's nice that it's everyone gets their story told. Absolutely. Again, when I was speaking to Stuart, I compared it to the uh, Frank Sidebottom documentary. Oh, they're being Frank. Yeah. Again, really great. And again, you know, it's lovely to see Chris's story out there being told to people, you know, so it's not just this weird image, like yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a man behind it and a story. I did a gig with him once and he doesn't take, he didn't take the head off the whole And he spoke in this voice and it's quite strange and seeing him lifting up this paper mache head and sort of... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, he was a bit of a character. Yeah. Only, only, yeah, kind of briefly brushed into his hemisphere doing a gig in the 90s. Is that how you got into comedy? Were you, were you on the circuit originally? Is that how you, it all started for you? Um, I basically, I was, I am a, a, an actor. Yeah. So I went to drama school and I, I did all of that and I left in uh 88 and but i was one of these i was i was a character actor really i remember the, the vice principal of lambda he said yeah he said you know uh, you're gonna have to get fatter older and uglier until you get the work that you deserve pop and he was right i had to really sort of because i was always cast as an older uh character in in the in the role in a, in a play I was always the either the old man or the villain and and these these were parts I wouldn't have got when I left drama school because they give it to someone who's the correct age I was like you know 22 yeah and so I thought well I'm like I don't know how long I can wait so I just decided to, I always loved comedy comedy was a big thing for me and Around that time in the 80s, comedy, of course, was the alternative comedy scene had sort of exploded at the beginning of the 80s. And I was even in a, uh, a comedy sketch group in the mid 80s before I went to drama school called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. And so we were doing like clubs like the Zap Club and, and whatnot, uh, doing a typical 80s free blokes. Uh, we did a thing called a uh, Christmas naivety play, which preempt the, the 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 three of a kind sketch where we sort of did it very amateur, a bit like the play that goes wrong. Yeah, type of thing. Um, and then yeah, I just drifted out of that, went to drama school, and then decided after a couple of years of dithering around, I think about 1990 when the next wave of comedy was yeah. coming through with your Harry Hills. Uh, and Stuart Lee and Joe Brand and Paul Merton, like the Bob Mills, these were all the names. Eddie Izzard was going to see all these people um, at that time, and I was just really inspired and, and so went into stand up. But I didn't do it for long. In fact, I, I went on a stand up course. Oh. I did a few uh, open spots in 1990 uh, around London, and then I decided to do a, a stand up course in where I live now, funnily enough, up in Archway in North London. Yeah. And one of the other people on that course was a very young teenage Matt Lucas. Oh, wow. <laughs> he was 18 and I was, well, how would I, 26 or something like that. 
and we of course got on like a house on fire and yeah i did i went into stand-up he he went right into it doing his Sir Bernard chumley character yeah. I, every time i'd book a gig he'd book 12 i mean he was he was on it but i to to my uh if i'm gonna blow smoke up my ass i, I did go quite quickly from open spots to half spots to big full spots yeah because i i'd worked on my act for quite a while before um grabbing the you know the bull by the horns so yeah i was doing the circuit but i, I didn't do it for long i found i couldn't take the that kind of bowling ball in your stomach as kevin eldon used to say just that low level anxiety the whole time yeah knowing oh i used to hate booking the gigs and but then i'd do it and you know invariably i don't didn't die often but and I really did have a great time at the beginning, and I just but it was I preferred bouncing off other people, and so I, I I did that for a while, and then I got into like cabaret stuff and, and sketch groups and things like that, and then found my way back into being an actor again. But it was very difficult. The main thing was above stage fright and nerves and. and is trying to balance uh, an acting career and a stand-up career because you you kind of have to make a, a, a decision. You either throw yourself in with one or the other because I would like would book all these stand-up gigs, and then my yeah. agent would say, oh, "You've got a job in the Isle of Man of doing Alan Blease does having a ball. It's going to be for a month out in Douglas." And I, oh, right, okay. So then I'd have to ring up all these comedy clubs and say, oh, I can't do this now. So, and then I'd come back after earning a few hundred quid and think, right, I've got to start all over again. So it's very hard because I, I had this stupid, naive notion that I would be doing um, acting in the day and, and stand up in the evening, yeah. you know. I'll be, yeah, I've been doing filming in the day, doing something, you know, and then going off in the evening to stand up. But it's very hard to balance the two. The only reason the likes of Alan Davies and Jack D and, and Matt could go do acting was because they established themselves as comedians first. Yeah. And were able then to have the luxury to do acting. Hello, Mr. Rich. Hello, Mr. Stew. I am Curious Orange. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't want to say anything, but when you said uh, that you left drama school in 1988, that's, mm. that's the year I was born. <laughs> I know. Do you know what I was thinking of today? Um, I was thinking uh, in 1982, um, Madness had a number one hit with House of Fun. Yeah. I remember when it got to number because I was a big Madness fan. And um, I was, I remember in my Crombie coat, Dr. Martin Boots, walking up the road and listening to it. Go, you know, welcome to the house of fun. And I'm thinking that was 40 years ago. And the, and, and I did that thing that everyone does now. Oh, and they make that timeline comparison that would have been in the middle of the Second World War for a 17, 16 year old today. Yeah. That's the thing. Be like me walking up the road, going da 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 doing Glenn Miller, you know. Yeah. But there's there's a big difference though, isn't there? Because that was all in black and white, the early forties. And you couldn't access it in 1982 yeah unless you watched dad's army and um which wasn't that was not even set in 90 you know you had a few old films and stuff like that but now yeah in a kid now will won't have that distance to look back at the early 80s because it's in color isn't it and yeah and pop and they probably got hits from 1982 on on their um smartphone Oh, yeah. so old, yeah, but it's all right. It makes me feel old when people refer to the nineties as retro. So, like, 
I, I think we all we all feel old in different ways. How do you feel old physically now? How old does that make you then? Oh, so I'm 33. I'm 30, 33. Yeah, 34. Oh, in you're October. a baby. You see, the thing is, you're you're just man now. Yeah. You're not a a, a toddler. You're not a, a, an adolescent. You're not a yeah teenager. You're not a young man. You're a man, and you've got that now until you're 40 when you're middle-aged man when did what's the well up from that what i'm 56 so i'm am i still middle-aged man or yeah i feel that's another oh. thing where i feel that the, the, <laughs> the classification of middle age mm. has got higher mm. because like people in their 50s are, are still quite cool so it's like you wouldn't say, well, you're in your 50s now, you're an old man. You know, that's that, that 50s feels like an extension of 40s almost, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like that's that has got bigger the definition of middle age. Well, because we it's it, the 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 divisions are blurred, aren't they? You can't especially with um uh kids and their uh, parents, it's not the same generational gap that i had with my parents yeah which, because i wouldn't have gone to glastonbury with my dad we wouldn't have worn the trainers together you know he had his thing and i had my thing yeah now it seems to have um crossed over and kind of all a bit yeah. mixed up i think with, like within the last couple of years we um my dad took me and my brother to a Genesis concert. All oh, right. And we took him to a Real Big Fish as a ska punk band. I know oh, Real Big Fish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it's like we did like a little generation swap in that yeah, regard. Yeah. But, it, but you know, just because we all like sort of hanging out and we all like music and stuff yeah. and that doesn't feel like that. Oh, you're the you're an old man, and we can't hang around with you. It's just you know we're just a little group of blokes now. Yeah, well, my 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 parents always played music in the house. That old cliche. There was always music playing in the house. It's like what people always say on six music interviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah like everyone. Anyway, <laughs> we. I like. I didn't dislike the music that they played, and they didn't seem to dislike. There were things I wasn't so keen on, um, but generally, I pretty much liked my dad's classical music and his jazz, and my mum's easy listening. And they didn't have a problem with um, most of the pop music I I played. I think um, Ian Dewey and the Blockheads. Some of the swearing. Yeah. I had to watch playing that, but uh, but he even my dad used to like Ian during the blockheads. He the one he used to like used to make me laugh. Where he would even now at ninety one, he still thinks he's cutting edge when he'll say something like, um, "Yeah, so uh, of course anything electric, electronic, it always go. Yeah, of course it's all down to uh, Gary Newman." Gary Newman invented electronic music. And I think, yeah, fine. I'm, I'm all right with that. You can, yeah. <laughs> always, that's always the name he drops. Anything with a synthesizer, just go, Gary Newman. <sighs> I, I, oh, I can't remember which, um, which, one, which one of my interviews it is. It's either um, my interview with Stuart or my interview with Mark Thomas. And hmm. someone commented underneath, um, like, how dare you? Chaz and Dave are still relevant. They were sampled in an Eminem song, and it's like, yeah. well, yeah, yes, they were, and that's like a good, mm. that's a fun fact. But yes. that song came out in 1999, so you can't yeah. count. <laughs> Twenty three years ago is not relevant. I know. Well, that 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 piece of trivia is being. Yeah, it's one of those things where everyone everyone knows that now. That people yeah. will still let's go. Oh, did you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like when people say, um, uh, "Who do you who who did you think in the Britpop wars?" Um, 
Blur versus Oasis. Who was your favourite? And someone go, yeah, it was Pulp, actually. Yeah. <laughs> As if they're, like, they're the first person to say that. Yeah. So it winds me up. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> You're so different. <laughs> yeah. Have a jelly baby. What are you curious about this week, the Curious Orange? Well, Mr Rich, I was curious about this little Come question. Come on, Joe, she's the first <laughs> No, I nearly had a chance to meet Alice Cooper. Oh, yeah. And if I remember correctly, we were doing um, um, doing the Little Britain tour back in 2005, 2006. Uh, we were doing a, a, a gig in, in some big city, and Alice Cooper was doing a gig. And he wanted to come over and meet Matt and Dave, but I, for some reason they wanted to get off. <laughs> I said, Alice Cooper. Oh, we met loads of people who used to come along. I bet, yeah. The Carly Minogue, the Paul McCartney, you had the, uh, the Strokes. And you've waited nearly an hour to drop all these names, Paul. <laughs> yeah. They all used to come along, see the show. Um, yeah, Kate Moss and Pete Doherty, yeah, they came along once mm -hmm. when they were an item. And a nice chat with Pete Doherty. I thought he was... Uh, very pleasant. <laughs> he 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 we had a long chat about Tony Hancock because he's a big Tony Hancock fan. Hence the Libertines album's called Up the Bracket, which is yeah. a catchphrase with Sid James. You'll have a punch up the punch bracket. Punch up the bracket. Yeah. yeah. No, he's now, nice. It's it's nice when you can talk to someone famous, mm. but like not about them, if that makes yeah. do you know what I mean? It's like I had a very brief, I don't want to big it up to be in anything bigger than it was, very brief chat with David Williams on Sunday mm. and about um, Brass Eye and Chris Morris. Yeah. And, um, and it was nice to, I sort of walked away with a big smile on my face. I was like, I, I chatted with David Williams for a few minutes, but it wasn't about Little Britain or... No, no, know, swimming it, the canal. And... Yeah, yeah. It was about something we sort of shared a passion of you know yeah david is um a real comedy nerd i mean he really genuinely loves his comedy and comedy history and I'm really on on it when it comes to stuff like that especially things like chris morris uh, he knows his onions definitely with uh, little britain in its original context of being such a huge show mm. did, did that make you more recognised when you were out and about? Because it felt like you were in so much of Little Britain. Yeah, well, I had, um, I mean, obviously I did the things before Little Britain, but yeah, yeah. The, the show was huge. Yeah, you know, it was, it certainly, yeah, I would get people coming up to me and saying, you know, mainly for the, the fat fighters. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and because that, I suppose, is the thing I was, the sketch I was mainly in. Yeah. And I, I'd get people saying, yeah, oh, do you see some dust and, and whatnot? Yeah, it's good. I, even now, I still get people who come up and say, how's Marjorie and, and, and all of that. Because it's one of those things, like you say, I mean, you you know, you've done lots of TV before that, mm. and I'm sure there's a whole generation of people that just mm. know you as the Curious Orange. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, like... It was so huge at the time, Little Britain, I, and I just thought, oh, I wonder if even, like, you know, you and Steve first were sort of the main extras or sort of secondary characters, and uh, yeah. I wondered if it had sort of, you know, given you, like, uh, more stardom for a few years or... Uh, well, you see, the thing is, you're, you're only... It's, when it's on television, you, you feel like that, and when, once it's off, you're kind of... Yeah, it, it's it's forgotten again. Um, it's like when you see an old, very old episode on of, of from a soap. I looked at some uh, old EastEnders thing the other day, and it was like from twenty years ago, or even not maybe not even as long ago as that, fifteen years ago. And you think, oh, I forgot all about that actor and that character. They were on my screen every other night for year in, year out. And now, yeah, yeah. Uh, do they get recognised in the street anymore? 
Yeah. Be that, oh, it's what were you in? I sometimes yeah. you get people come out and go, oh, you used to be famous. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Not famous enough for you to know who I am right now. And, and what I was in, even. Yeah. That's, yeah. Like, that always makes you laugh. Oh man, you're like you're really famous. I said, who am I? I don't know. What was I being? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Why do flamingos stand wow. on one leg? Why don't they stand on two legs like everybody else? What are you doing now? What are you working on at the minute? Uh, anything exciting? Well, I've been. Um, I just did a thing out in Serbia, which I, 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 I you know, you can't really. Yeah. say what it is but i did a, a, a tv drama which was a nice part then i went out to there to belgrade for uh, a few weeks and uh, that was a bit scary because of covid yeah because you think oh god if i get it i'm gonna have to spend christmas in a hotel room but it was a, a brilliant job to do i hadn't done something like that in a while because what with covid it's you know had a a massive effect on the industry i did a call the midwife and, uh, and uh, some radio jobs here and there but yeah it's um that was the last big thing i did i've got a little thing in the pipeline which um uh, i'm i'm not going to say quite what it is yet because i might not do it and i'm going to look like a see you next tuesday if i <laughs> so i've got something in the pipeline okay uh, but it's always when actors say that you think, oh, nothing then. But no, <laughs> this is something I'm working on. I did a, a show, um, going back to Madness, actually, the band. Yeah. Did an Edinburgh show back in 2019. And I'm hoping to write that up into some kind of book. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that'd be good. So that, that I'm going to try and get on top of that. And then just I'm just going up doing these bloody self tapes yeah. where you have to film yourself doing your auditions and you have to get all your costume and lighting and editing and get your other half to read the other lines. And it's, I mean, it's, it's fun in a yeah. way, but it, it, what they ask of you now, you just think, Oh God. Okay. I've just got one tonight where I just think, right. I've got to find a bloody top hat in the, What's going to wear? Or should I have to shave for it? And I've just grown my beard to a disgusting kind of homeless man's length. Yeah. And I'm going to shave it all off. Yeah. So because basically casting people don't have the greatest imagination, so you have to really spell it out. Well, he can't do it. He's got a beard. Not He's thinking, got a beard. I can just I'll, shave this off. I'll shave it off. And that, but no, um, to all the casting directors out there, you're wonderful. I didn't mean that really. <laughs> and so handsome and good looking. Yes. <laughs> no, so I've got no they're, they're they're good in a way. Doing self tapes, at least you can you get the one you 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 the final Yeah. It, you don't feel like if you fuck it up first time it's done yes, for like yeah. Erase that and have another go, have another go. So you, that is massively to your advantage. But I just don't know how people, certain people who aren't, I mean, I'm, I'm technologically, I'm pretty shy. So how these people who, do, who don't even, you know, you have to have a smartphone, you have to have a tripod, you have to have lighting, you have to have space. I mean, they say something like, oh, we need a full length um, shot of you for the slate where you say what your name is. And, you, and it's like my girlfriend almost has to stand in another postcode because my I don't live in an aircraft hangar, you know. No. It's, and your your sofa's, you know, in in shot, and <laughs> you have to clear everything away. And it's, oh, it's so hard oh. being an aircraft, Mark. Yeah, I, I do. I do feel sorry for you. No, it's that yeah. I do that. It's like I have this fake little area mm. that's like, oh, look how clean and everything's nice and on a shelf, and yeah. it's like over there is just a disaster. Like, you know what I yeah. mean? That is, there's a spare bed covered in crap. There's just a big pile of crap over there. And it's just, but in this little area, it looks very nice and neat. Did you see that that went viral last year where it was the American guy doing a Zoom casting and the, the, the casting directors didn't realize they, 
they could be heard. And this poor young actor was setting himself up and the guy was going, oh my God, look at the day car. How do people live like this? And he went, well, if you give me the job, then maybe I'll, I'll be able to afford a better apartment, you know. <laughs> oh my God, did you hear that? I'm so sorry. And this will, and he put it out there online, so. <laughs> Yeah, and that could either work in your favour or, you know, completely blacklist you from getting in. Yeah, yeah, it was a risk. Yeah. But um, where where can people, if they want to see what you're up to, and if, if this pipeline project ever well, appears... I'm, 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 I'm inside, I'm, I'm, it will be cranked out at some point this year. It's just having a... You know what it's like? You have to kind of coalesce all these yeah. factors um yeah it's just a little thing i think people find it fun and uh maybe slightly nostalgic exciting very intriguing but yeah so is it at the real paul putner on oh well i'll tweet it on my stupid account and um when when this thing's gonna eventually uh hit the ground um stumbling (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so if people go and follow you at, at Real Paul Putner, and, yeah, uh, that, and... Real Paul Putner, I'm not blue ticked or anything like that. Yeah. I don't really, I'm not political on it. I don't. It was just, I just tweet ephemeral crap basically. Yeah. I'm trying to break Twitter with a slurry of of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy it. I enjoy following you. I think it's uh, oh, well, very, you very, very interesting. Some of the stuff well, it's, it's just, I just, it's mainly just me reminiscing or making stupid, mildly amusing c- comic observations. Yeah. yeah. Well worth. You well worth. Careful, though, you know, you say the. Um, I've sometimes you, you go on there and you you tweet something at two in the morning and you just wake up. <laughs> oh no check yeah don't ever tweet at two in the morning no i mean uh, just don't tweet i think for the most <laughs> yeah for the most part oh uh, paul thank you ever so much for talking to me i i mean we've literally That's covered good. barely anything that I wanted to talk to you about, but I've had so much fun chatting to you. I really oh, have. Well, well, that's, that's lovely. Yeah, I, Cause you get a little bit nervous with doing these things. Cause you want to be um, vaguely engaging <laughs> and you don't want to be talking about yourself t- too much. Yeah. And also you want to repeat yourself. I've done a couple of these things before and, um, and sometimes you get asked the same questions and you think, Oh, what else can yeah. I say? No, I think it's quite it's fun, you know, and uh, it's going back to like what I say. When I first started doing them, it was very much, here mm. is a question, I wait for your answer, and then I go, mm. okay, and then we move on to the next question. Uh, and over like the past two years of doing them, mm. lots of them have just turned into conversations where it's like, if, if we hit the stuff that's on my list, yeah. yeah. If not, you know, it's just nice to sort of, chat well it's because i suppose in a way you you, i've missed it yeah you know in like this is a bit like being in the pub really quite (laughs) literally because i've had a beer on the go i hope that's acceptable that's fine that's fine i've got half a coke because i'm driving um all right and while doing a podcast (laughs) keep your eyes on the road Bow yourself, Mark.